全員死刑。根は曲がるいずれ風に吹き落とされる教授を許すさようなら Gigi milu kalau minum gigi dingin terus kondisi gigi sangat. Tomato, naranu. No one knew where the zombies came from. It was a sunny afternoon. The teacher and a few students were on the rooftop, gardening. Suddenly, they heard horrifying screams from below. Perplexed, they approached and saw students running frantically, some turning violent and attacking others. The entire school plunged into chaos. Kurumi was bewildered, and suddenly a girl fell from the sky. In the next second, the girl turned into a zombie. Kurumi sat there, terrified. A caring senior rushed over, grabbed Kurumi, and hurriedly led her away. On the way, Kurumi meets a classmate who has been bitten, and sees that the other classmate's eyes have already turned white and Kurumi is still dumbfounded. At the critical moment, the senior blocked the fatal bite for Kurumi. Kurumi helps the infected senpai up to the rooftop. Little did they know, 
there were infected individuals there as well. A few students ran downstairs in panic, unaware that downstairs was even more dangerous. The teacher tried to stop everyone, but it was too late. Seeing zombies closing in, the teacher could only close the door and use a refrigerator to block it. However, there was still a zombie on the rooftop. Yuri was almost bitten, but the brave teacher intervened just in time and killed the zombie. Yet, the danger was not over. The bitten senior was undergoing mutation, gradually losing consciousness and approaching Kurumi. Kurumi picked up a shovel from the ground and decisively struck. The school, and even the entire island, had fallen. Only one teacher and three students survived. They wrote a large SOS on the rooftop, hoping a rescue team would find them. Luckily, there were a few vegetable gardens on the rooftop, temporarily solving their food problem. However, relying on vegetables for too long would lead to malnutrition. Kurumi and Yuri are going to the canteen to find some staples and meat for a balanced diet. They carefully approached the ground floor and saw several zombies roaming in the hall. Yuri took out ping pong balls prepared in advance and threw them in different directions, diverting the attention of the zombies. Seeing that the zombies are distracted, they rush through the hall. Once they cross this corridor, they can go straight to the canteen. However, at the corner, there was another zombie. Seeing it about to turn around, they quickly crouched. The zombie, with its low vision, didn't notice them, just as they relaxed. Yuri suddenly looked terrified. Another zombie appeared in front of them, and in the next second, it pounced towards Kurumi. Kurumi blocked the attack with the shovel, but the noise attracted the other zombie back. Yuri kept swinging the bat in her hand. She did no damage to the zombies as if she was giving them a massage. Yuri was so scared that she sat down on the floor. Just as Kurumi finished off one zombie, another zombie jumped at her. Seeing that the zombie had grabbed Yuri's long legs, Kurumi pushed away the one in front of her with all her strength. Kurumi then swung the shovel to kill the zombies and save Yuri. They then proceeded to the cafeteria, finding it in a dilapidated state. However, they managed to discover a pack of noodles. Suddenly, Kurumi heard a noise. Holding the shovel, she approached slowly, unexpectedly. Upon opening the door, she was tackled by something inside. As Kurumi flipped over, she realized it was a surviving student. For safety, they conducted a thorough examination, confirming no injuries before relaxing. The student turned out to be Mickey, a sophomore who had been hiding in the cafeteria since the virus outbreak until they found her. To welcome Mickey, they ate the Italian noodles obtained at the cost of a life. However, amidst the joyous atmosphere, Mickey wore a troubled expression. Food would eventually run out, and she didn't want to sit idly waiting for that to happen. Early the next day, the school's broadcast inexplicably started playing, attracting zombies with its familiar melody. It turns out that Mickey purposely played the radio to gather the zombies in order to leave the school. Upon hearing the music, Kurumi and Yuri rushed to the broadcasting room to turn it off. Yuki Takeya also found Mickey, who was about to leave, but no matter how she persuaded, it was in vain. Although Mickey had a set of car keys, she couldn't locate the vehicle. With zombies closing in, they climbed onto a van, surrounded instantly by the zombies. This sight reminded Mickey of the virus outbreak when she witnessed classmates being dragged away by zombies. When Mickey regained her composure, Kurumi was attempting to distract the zombies with noise, but it proved ineffective. Seeing them in dire straits, Yuri returned to the broadcasting room, selecting a song she liked. The zombies were attracted to the sound. Seizing the opportunity, Yuki Takeya pulled Mickey off the van, and they passed through the zombie crowd finally returning to the safe zone, although narrowly escaping danger, food was running scarce. They had to take the risk and venture into the school storage room for supplies. The two formidable high school students teamed up and charged into the corridor filled with zombies. Despite being their first time teaming up, their coordination was seamless, quickly dispatching all the zombies. Their efforts were not in vain, 
The storage room was filled with various life essentials, providing more than enough to sustain them for several years. However, amid their joyous efforts to move the supplies, a zombie suddenly appeared. Kurumi raises her shovel to attack, only to realize it's her senior. Various pleasant memories flash through Kurumi's mind. Kurumi, who was already in love with Senpai, hesitated this time. The zombified senior, without hesitation, tackled Kurumi to the ground, intent on biting her. In a critical moment, Yuri intervened, wielding a fire extinguisher and promptly killing the zombie. With abundant life supplies, their lives gradually returned to normal. They planted vegetables together on the rooftop, engaged in pillow fights, and spent evenings stargazing. However, the joyous times were always so fleeting, just as they were having a party, the fire alarm suddenly rang for unknown reasons, its piercing sound echoing throughout the entire campus. Zombies began to stir, converging towards the teaching building. When they reached the ground floor, they found a zombie playing with fire self-immolating everyone was instantly stupefied the zombie horde broke through barriers flooding in amidst the chaos they were forced to separate one of the zombies jumped at them and kurumi blocked it with a shovel telling the two people behind him to hurry up and leave on the second floor yuri discovered it was already infested with zombies mickey had just dealt with one when they accidentally fell zombies behind them closed in and more broke through the doors in front Screams rang throughout the campus as zombie hands stretched out of the window. The zombies were already hungry and thirsty. They got up and ran, passing through the zombie horde into an activity room. They used tables and chairs to barricade the door, but the zombies soon breached the defenses. They were on the verge of peril. Yuki Takeya, with zero combat ability, sat on the ground, emitting a desperate scream. Only Kurumi managed to escape to the rooftop, attempting to hold off the zombies. However, their numbers were overwhelming, and even the formidable Kurumi found herself cornered in a one square meter space, completely trapped at the last moment when she was about to give up. She thought of the words that her senpai had once said to her. Love's strength was indeed formidable. Kurumi bravely stood up once again, leaped from the rooftop, and, picking up a shovel from the ground, swung it with determination. She didn't blink an eye as she killed zombies all the way from the rooftop to the event room. Meanwhile, Yuri and Mickey were still struggling against the zombies. Fortunately, Kurumi arrived in time, successfully rescuing them. However, Yuki Takeya and the teacher's whereabouts remained unknown. The hallway was filled with bird bodies, and the smell of barbecue permeated the air. They traversed the corridor, finally finding them in the infirmary. Tragically, the teacher had turned into a zombie. It turned out that even before the fire occurred, the teacher had been bitten while trying to protect the students. Knowing she would soon mutate, she pushed the students out of the infirmary, choosing to stay behind alone. Even after turning into a zombie, she didn't forget to protect the students, tying herself up with a rope. They were engulfed in sorrow. Kurumi, teary-eyed once again lifted the shovel to bid the teacher farewell. In the movie's finale, all zombies were eradicated. The surviving four deeply bowed to the school, then drove away, seeking a new safe zone.
In a prison known as the Vertical Self-Management Center, Gorang wakes up in a concrete cell with the number 48 on its wall. There's nothing but a bed and a sink for him to use and a hole in the middle of the floor, which his cellmate Tarnagasi calls the pit. There are hundreds of floors like theirs, all of them with two prisoners using fake names assigned by the manager. Every day, food is lowered on a platform through the hole, and you have two minutes to eat as much as possible before it leaves to a lower floor. The lower you are, the fewer chances you have of eating anything. At the end of each month, prisoners are shuffled and sent to different floors. When Gorang sees the platform for the first time, he decides not to eat because he isn't hungry, and he'd rather leave food for the lower levels. After eating as much as he can, Trimagasi spits on the table, knowing people above probably do the same. Gorang decides to keep an apple for later, but after the platform leaves, the cell begins to feel extremely hot. It turns out that keeping food is forbidden, so Gorang has to get rid of the apple or they'll burn to death. This makes Gorang think about the interview he had before entering the place, when he had to sign a paper accepting the fact he can't get out until the agreed period is over. Every prisoner has a choice to bring one item with them, and Gorang chose to bring a copy of Don Quixote. Gorang came here voluntarily, he'll spend six months in exchange for an accredited diploma. The next day, Gorang refuses to eat again when the platform comes, and Trimagasi thinks floor 48 is wasted on him. Gorang asks Trimagasi for his story, and Trimagasi explains it all started with a television ad. He bought an extraordinary knife that he saw on TV, but only a few days later, they released a new ad promoting an even better knife. This made him so furious that he took the TV and threw it out the window, killing a guy that was passing by. Trimagasi was given a choice between a psychiatric hospital and the hole, so here he is. The lowest he's gone was 132, thus he knows there are more floors than that because he could see them below. No food reaches the lower levels, and a month down there isn't that bad, the problem is when you get two lower levels in a row. Gorang is scared of this possibility and tries to talk to the people on the other floors to ask them to ration their food, but he's ignored. Trimagasi replies by pissing into the lower floor, he also reveals that the item he chose to bring with him is the knife he bought from TV. The next time the platform comes by, Gorang finally begins to eat. He also sees a person from the upper levels fall through the hole, and Trimagasi says this is very common but nobody will do anything about it. Trimagasi tells Gorang about all the floors he's been on and mentions they'll be together next month. Gorang realizes that cellmates are kept together when they're shuffled and finally understands Trimagasi ate his previous cellmate when he was on the lower floors. When the platform comes by again, Miharu is sitting on it. Gorang worries about her because he notices she's injured, but Trimagasi tells him to ignore her. Miharu comes down the hole once a month to look for her missing child, she also kills every cellmate she gets in order to have more chances to be paired with her child the following month, the guy they saw falling was probably her victim. Trimagasi then explains that unlike her, he never killed anyone, he just ate the body that fell on his floor. When the platform goes to the next level, the prisoners try to take advantage of Miharu. Gorang yells at them to leave her alone, but it isn't necessary, Miharu just kills them and returns to the platform. When the month reaches its end, the prisoners are put to sleep with gas and shuffled around. When Gorang wakes up, he finds himself tied to his bed on floor 171. Trimagasi explains he tied Gorang up because he's younger and stronger, so Trimagasi has to protect himself. Screaming can be heard from the other floors that indicate people reacting to their new levels, and when the platform comes, there's not even a crumb left. After eight days, Trimagasi announces it's finally time for him to get some food. Ignoring Gorang's pleas for mercy, Trimagasi uses his knife to get some meat from Gorang's thigh, but before he can eat it, the platform arrives, bringing Miharu with it. Miharu remembers how much Gorang worried about her and jumps on Trimagasi, attacking him with his own knife. Then she frees Gorang and hands him the knife so he can use it to finish Trimagasi off. Gorang passes out after that, and he wakes up later to find himself on the bed. Miharu has bandaged his leg with a piece of bed sheet, and she's now eating Trimagasi. She brings some meat to Gorang who accepts after some hesitation, she also brings him some water before leaving on the platform without a word. Days pass and Trimagasi's body begins to rot, giving Gorang the chance to feed on worms too. Gorang also begins hallucinating, seeing Trimagasi's ghost judge him as he eats. At the end of the month, Gas takes over the cell and Gorang dreams of being with a woman again while Miharu watches. When he wakes up, he discovers that the one licking him is a dog. To Gorang's shock, his new cellmate is Imogiri, the woman that did his interview when he volunteered to enter this prison. The dog is the item she chose to bring with her, and they're now on level 33. Gorang remembers the day of the interview and how Imogiri made creepy pauses between questions. In the present, Imogiri explains she volunteered as Gorang did, and that she didn't know people died here. As far as she knows, there are 200 levels, and when Gorang explains there isn't enough food for all the people here, Imogiri points out that the amount of food would be fine if people only ate what they needed. Something that fosters a spontaneous sense of solidarity needs to happen, but Gorang finds the idea ridiculous. He does wonder if change could be achieved by the death of a child, but Imogiri sure the company policy doesn't accept under 16s. 
when the platform brings them food, Imogiri only eats what she needs, and after giving some to her dog, she begins preparing two rations of food. Once the platform reaches the lower level, Imogiri tries to reason with the prisoners, telling them to eat the rations she prepared and make two more for the next level to pass on the message. Obviously she is completely ignored, and Gorang points out that the administration doesn't actually want solidarity to happen. Imogiri hates that Gorang thinks all administration is bad because she worked for them without issues, but Gorang replies that being a former worker gave her the privilege of choosing her cellmate. Imogiri doesn't give up and keeps on trying to ration the food every day, but she continues to be ignored by the lower levels. Two weeks later, Gorang finally gets tired of all her yelling and tells the people that if they don't follow Imogiri's instructions, he'll relieve himself on the food every day and they'll have to eat poop. The threat works and the prisoners start passing the messages to the lower levels. Sometime later, the platform comes down with an unconscious Miharu on it. Gorang and Imogiri put her on a bed and take care of her while the dog steals some food. Once the platform leaves, the cell begins feeling extremely cold, and Gorang has to chase the dog to take back the food he stole before they're killed for breaking the rules. In the evening, Gorang leaves the bed to Miharu and sleeps on the floor, only to wake up to find the girls fighting. It turns out Miharu killed the dog to eat him. The next day, Miharu leaves on the platform. Gorang tells Imogiri about Miharu's search for her child, but Imogiri explains Miharu came alone 10 months ago. She was an actress with no family that volunteered to come just like Gorang. Imogiri sent people down here without knowing how bad it was, and she's been fighting cancer for three years. When she discovered she lost that fight, she volunteered to come because she thought she could make a difference, but she doesn't care anymore. On their last day on floor 33, Gorang tries to make Imogiri eat something because they may not have food tomorrow, but Imogiri is too depressed to leave the bed. The next morning, Gorang wakes up to discover he's on floor 202, meaning there are more levels than Imogiri knew about. Such revelation was too much for Imogiri to handle and used her bedsheets to end things for herself. At that moment, Trimagasi's hallucination appears again, wondering if Gorang will eat his new friend. This time he's joined by Imogiri and her dog, who insist he should eat her body. Gorang tries his best to ignore their constant rambling, and he tries to keep himself busy with other things. He tricks his stomach by eating pages of his book, and he takes a plate shard to start counting the days on the wall. Eventually the hunger becomes too much though, and Gorang finally begins feeding on Imogiri while Trimagasi guides him on where to cut. Sometime later, the next shuffle comes and Gorang is pleased to discover he's on floor 6. The person on the other bed is Miru, who comes after him with a knife, but this turns out to be just a dream. Gorang's new cellmate is actually Baharat, whose chosen item was a rope. Baharat is very excited because he thinks he can climb all the way to the top from here, and he asks the people on level 5 for help. The couple above teases him before accepting to grab the rope, but when Baharat starts climbing, the other prisoner lowers her pants and defecates on Baharat's face. Shocked and disgusted, Baharat lets go of the rope and falls, Gorang catches him just in time but the rope is lost in the hole. When the platform comes, they have to eat while listening to the prisoners on level 5 get frisky. As time passes, the hallucinations of Trimagasi and Imogiri show up again. Trimagasi says Gorang is doing great because he only has one more month to go, and Imogiri reminds him that change never happens spontaneously. This inspires Gorang to think of a plan, and he asks Baharat for help. They should jump on the platform with whatever weapon they can find, and make sure people ration the food so that everyone can eat. Gorang did the math when he was on floor 202, and judging by the time the platform takes to move, he thinks there are around 250 levels, which should be doable. Baharat accepts to work together and they break a bed to use its pieces of metal-like weapons. The two of them jump on the platform and go to level 7, where Gorang points out they shouldn't allow the prisoners to grab anything. These people ate yesterday and will eat tomorrow for sure, so they should only start handing out food after level 50, which are the people having trouble. Baharat hesitates because these prisoners are his friends that helped him climb up some weeks before, but as soon as the old man reacts furiously, Baharat sees Gorang's point and begins helping him keep everyone away. The pair keeps going down while threatening people to keep the food untouched. After a few more floors, Baharat is shocked to come across Brambang, an old wise man that Baharat respects. Brambang approves of what the boys are trying to do, but he points out that the administration doesn't have a conscience and won't care if they succeed, but perhaps the workers on level Sarah will, so they need a symbol. Baharat and Gorang choose the panna because it's a very luxurious dish and will cause quite an impression if it arrives untouched to the bottom. The mission continues as they keep going down, keeping the panna safe while keeping people away with threats. Once they reach level 50, Baharat and Gorang begin handing out rations of food, and people are extremely grateful. On level 97, they find a sick old man and a mentally disabled boy. Gorang tries to feed the old man some soup, but the boy tells them not to bother because he'll kill the man later anyway to feed on him. The next level only has a body on it, and Gorang guesses this is where Miharu woke up. The platform doesn't stop here because there aren't any living people, which means Gorang's calculations were wrong and there are more than 250 floors. On the following floor, 
they find two men attacking Miuru. One of them has a sword and the other is huge and burly, so when Goreng and Baharat jump in to help the girl, it is extremely hard to defend themselves. Baharat manages to get his guy first and then he helps Goreng kill the big man, but unfortunately it's too late for Miharu, who is already dead. Goreng wants to mourn her, but Baharat drags him back on the platform before it leaves them behind. The two of them keep going down and handing out food to the prisoners they see, although many floors only have dead bodies on them. Eventually the platform stops at level 333, which seems to be the last one. At first they think it's empty, but there's actually someone hiding under the bed, it's Molly, the missing child. Baharat and Goreng approach the kid, and as soon as they leave the platform, it starts going down again. Goreng asks Baharat to throw the panakata into the hole, but Baharat refuses. To their surprise, the room doesn't get hot or cold to punish them, and after lots of hesitation, Burda gives the panakata to Molly. The three of them stay on that floor, and Goreng keeps being haunted by Trimagasi, Imogiri, and now Miharu as well. Suddenly Baharat agrees with the ghosts, telling Goreng that the girl is the message, and when Goreng wakes up, he discovers Baharat died because of his bleeding injuries. The next time the platform comes, Goreng brings Molly with him and they're lowered into floor Saro, which is completely dark and empty. Trimagasi appears to tell Goreng to come off the platform because he isn't part of the message, and together they watch the platform go up with Molly, hoping that she will show the abusers above the reality of the situation. Make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you can watch more videos like this. Thanks for watching. In 1995, a website was created by a man known as none other than Kevin TX. It's called Paranoia.com, and its main focus was to foster what he described as a free speech platform to anyone wanting to host their own little piece of cyberspace. The website largely functioned as a repository. Back during its prime, hundreds of users flocked to Kevin's site, hosting all sorts of strange, abrasive web pages on his servers. In fact, Kevin partook in this too, and seemed to relish in the fact that paranoia was garnering so much attention, so quickly. Just to set things straight, paranoias run not-for-profit. I personally provided all of the initial equipment and have supported the system's costs in finances and time at a personal loss because I feel so strongly about the presence of a system like this on the net. It's been very rewarding to watch an idealistic dream turn into reality. I've met a lot of really great net denizens and have seen firsthand how this project has been able to empower people who wouldn't otherwise have nice net access at a low cost. It's clear that Kevin's motives were noble, even if some of what he states on his various pages are a bit... eccentric. Nevertheless, he harbors an excitement for community, a drive to give people a voice of expression, and scattered across Paranoia's archives, for better or worse, we're able to find just that. Paranoia.com is expansive and contains some of the most random and bizarre content that I've ever seen. It's a mixed bag, a look into the minds of complete strangers, a time capsule, if you will, of the wholly unconventional and immoral. Paranoia.com slash Satan contains the name emblazoned over a black background. Paranoia.com slash extreme brings us to an unapologetically 90s homepage for an electronic store. 
Paranoia.com slash the slurp lands us on a page for <sighs> pedophile pride. Jesus Christ. And paranoia.com slash stag brings us to the homepage of a very outspoken stranger named Stag Meander. It was very cool of Paranoia to set up this server so depraved bastards like me can put up subversive web pages like this one. Thanks, dude. Of course, all of this is but a tiny sample of what you can find here. However, by now, I'm sure you all get the picture. Paranoia's reign over the internet throughout the 1990s was relatively big and even gained the attention of major media outlets like the Austin Chronicle at one point granting Kevin TX an award for best local website back during its heyday. This site, from top to bottom, is a monumental rabbit hole, and the interesting thing about it is that it's been archived hundreds of times on the Wayback Machine since it was created. Unfortunately though, this is the only way to access it today, since Paranoia.com was eventually shut down due to server issues. Reportedly, the project became too much for Kevin to handle. And so, by the late 1990s, he had informed users that it would officially be sent to die. That's not to say that the URL itself is dead, though. In fact, it's very much still alive. And upon heading to it today, Wait, that can't be right. P-A-R-A... Yeah, that's right. There's no way this is the actual s- Nope. Nope, it's Disney. But I don't remember ever hearing about this, or watching, or playing, or experiencing anything remotely close to paranoia. Paranoia, by definition, doesn't exactly scream family-friendly. So why in the world are we led here? At 4 in the morning on February 18th of 2021, a Reddit user named Logical Elephant made their way to a subreddit called r slash internet mysteries, a hub dedicated to uncovering oddities from the dark side of the net. Curious about a recent, almost random discovery they had, they inquire about Paranoia.com and its strange connection to Disney. Disney owns Paranoia.com, which was a controversial, kind of illegal website in 1995. I've noticed that searching for Paranoia.com redirects you to the Disney page. What puzzles me is that in 1995, Paranoia hosted many controversial, or close to illegal content websites. I'm not sure if it's normal for them to buy these types of pages, but it seems strange to me. I've seen that in approximately 2000, Paranoia closed and became kind of a French page. Then it would redirect you to Disney.com. Being a controversial page at the time, has anyone heard about it? I've been researching and I can't find any information about the page. For example, Rotten.com was also working at that time and there's much more information about this. This means that Disney bought this domain, and if so, why would it buy such a domain? It's a question so simple, yet it piques the enduring interest of internet denizens like me. Why do they own this domain? And why are they still sitting on it to this day? Below this, the OP includes a myriad of updates that they stumbled upon after their initial discovery, one of which being a link to a repository of URLs the Disney companies purchased since their online inception. Hosted on a website named HackerOne.com, we can observe a trove of URLs, with some containing purposeful misspellings, some related to their parks, some to their gaming department, and even a few random outliers that I wasn't quite able to source. 
Even with this, though, paranoia, with its peculiar, adult-oriented definition, stands as a stark outlier, an anomaly of sorts, in this list of family-friendly titles. All in all, though, this list, while handy to have, unfortunately doesn't tell us much about the broader picture. Logical Elephant returns to r slash internet mysteries for one more go at getting eyes on this case. A few days ago, I made this post about Paranoia.com and its connection with Disney.com. Although I haven't solved why Disney bought it, I've discovered a lot of things about Paranoia.com and it's very interesting. Paranoia.com was a website that hosted pages created by its users for free. This, with a lack of control of the internet in 1995, equals posts about pedophilia, drugs, prostitution, euthanasia, television cracking, bizarre images, and mind control. That, and along with other pages that were against internet censorship. There was not much interaction between users, except with those mentioned in the wall of the page, since it was not a social network in itself. It was just a place to make your page and add the content you want. It closed because its bandwidth had been reduced, and Kevin asked to avoid using this server to keep what they had usable until they disappeared. Below this one, they link to various 90s articles mentioning paranoia, along with a Unabomber fan site, something called the Church of Euthanasia, where they explain how to cook a human body, a psychoactive drug archive, and a site focused on The Simpsons. Interestingly though, this go-around, their post caught much more attention, lending this investigation a theory and desperately needed. I think you nailed the reason Disney bought the domain. It was likely a title for one of their projects. Buying domains tied to IPs is extremely common in the media business. The reason you might not be finding a lot of examples is because Disney and other corporations use shell companies to buy domains so they don't get extorted on the price, and also to conceal their involvement with the domain until they're ready. For example, if Activision bought a domain called Skyrim2ElectricBoogaloo.com, that would tip everyone off that they were making a direct sequel to Skyrim before they were ready to announce the project. Similarly, a woman who owned a small business making coffee cups that were powder blue around the top wouldn't ask for as much money for her Skyrim.com domain if the company offering to buy it was called Ted Franklin Consulting LLC and not Bethesda. I'm not gonna lie, I like this theory because it just makes sense. But there is one thing throwing a wrench in this, at least for me. I need to give you some context on where I'm coming from, though. So let's take a quick detour. Back to... internet adoption was growing. It was an unmapped expanse, ripe for the taking, perfect for those wanting to make a quick buck. Companies left and right swooped in, buying up hundreds, thousands of domain names centered around anything and everything you can think of. Pets.com, Broadcast.com, Ranch.com, Gandalf.com, MSN, eBay, Amazon, you name it. The stock market was growing at an unprecedented rate as even corporations and entrepreneurs with no prior internet experience were getting in on the action. Internet domains were currency and those with an eye for business saw an opportunity. The gold rush was on 
and for a while, things seemed to be going pretty damn good. People left their day jobs to trade stocks. Company valuations peaked. However, something was on the horizon. Something unforeseen. A little something called Y2K scared the ever-living shit out of people, and it was all based in a lack of technological foresight. There was this persistent belief that computers, the internet, and technology as it was known would cease to function at the turn of the millennium, all because the first two digits of the year were set in stone within computer systems. Effectively, as the clock approached the new year, computers wouldn't understand where to go next. Time would progress backwards. In essence, throwing everything reliant on the internet at the time into complete chaos. This idea, this fear, only catalyzed the frenzy of what later became known as the dot-com bubble. The hysteria of buying up every domain you can think of in hopes for a big payday. But as the year 2000 came and went, everything turned out fine. The storm quelled, and the stock market fell from its peak. Down, down. Back to where it all began. It's not out of the realm of possibility that Disney partook in this, even if paranoia is a considerable outlier in the domains they purchased. But let me ask you something. Why would the Walt Disney Company in the early 2000s purchase Paranoia.com and not Aladdin.com is not owned by Disney. Snowwhite.com isn't either. Fantasia.com, same story. And Aliceinwonderland.com, I'm sure you get the idea. Some of the biggest Disney IPs in history have URLs that are not owned by the company that popularized them. However, paranoia is. Now, while this commenter's theory is a solid one, I'm just not convinced this is why they have it. Over the years, whispers about this mystery have come and gone. Theories crop up, yet lead to nothing. It seems like it just wasn't getting the attention it needed. But it is weird. Before we continue, tonight's video has been brought to you by PDS Debt. Aside from taxes, I think we can all agree that one of the most despised things imaginable is debt. In the past, I've fought with this pretty heavily with car payments, credit card bills, both private and public student loans, medical bills, personal loans. It seemed like everything was clawing for my wallet. I really wish there was a better way back then to consolidate everything on my plate into one simple payment. But now there is. PDS Debt provides options that consolidate all of your debts into one low monthly payment. If you've been making payments every month and your balances aren't going down because of egregious interest rates, this program is for you. PDS Debt offers customized plans based upon your own financial situation and works with you to get on top of it, ultimately saving you thousands in the long run in interest and fees. 
PDS Debt is offering a free debt analysis, and it only takes 30 seconds. So head over to pdsdebt.com slash nextbone to get your free debt assessment today. Thank you so much to PDS Debt for sponsoring tonight's video. Now let's get back to it. And now, our feature presentation. Explain like I'm five. Can someone tell me how come when you put the URL paranoia.com, it takes you to disney.com? Companies will buy domains that share names with their products so that if someone just types in the name of their product, they get sent to the company's website. In this case, Disney released a movie titled Paranoia, so they bought paranoia.com and set it to ship people to disney.com. Typically, they'll ship people to a page on their website related to the named product. But in this case, the movie is several years old and wasn't a success, so they aren't promoting it on their website, just dumping you on Disney.com. <sighs> in 2013, a movie released starring Harrison Ford, Liam Hemsworth, Gary Oldman, and Amber Heard. It was an action thriller about an employee caught up in a heist situation and... Okay, okay, I'm not gonna bore you with the details here. Paranoia was a film distributed by a studio named Relativity Media. Relativity Media was launched in 2004 and was a subsidiary of Sony Pictures. Sony Pictures and the Walt Disney Corporation are two entirely separate entities. And essentially, this theory, one that was accepted by the Redditor who asked the question, unfortunately isn't exactly true. Like I said, whispers about this mystery have come and gone, and that's led to an inconvenient reality. Discussion about paranoia and Disney.com is scant, and answers have been admittedly difficult to come by. With this, I'd like to pivot our tactics here. Instead of focusing on what's been said about this in the past, let's rather direct our attention right to the source. Welcome back to Paranoia. According to the Wayback Machine, it's been archived over 430 times since December of 1996. However, the major phases hinted at by Logical Elephant involved the years 1996, 1999, 2001, and 2002. Scrubbing through Paranoia's archives for ourselves, we're able to see that its early years were more or less uneventful. Kevin TX appeared to be growing his platform, and at a cursory glance, it seemed to be taken off. The structure of his front page mostly remained the same, too, as paranoia was nothing but a hub of sorts. Just for the odd and unconventional. In the year 1998, though, we can observe a pretty substantial change. There are only two archives during this time period. However, jumping to the latest one gives us not the main website, but a message. Unfortunately, Paranoia.com is no more. All but one of the pages here have been moved since at least the summer of 1998. Please visit your favorite search engine to try to locate the page's new home. When it comes to Paranoia.com as we know it, this archived version is it. This message remains here for nearly two years. Well, until Paranoia.com undergoes this change. At first glance, this seems like your typical early 2000s homepage, just in French. Reminiscent of cyberspace titans like MSN and AOL, Paranoia.com begins hosting news 
stock information, the weather, and even offers its own email service. The interesting thing about this, though, is that the site actually doesn't go by paranoia at all, as all across the site, we see another title. It's something called Excite, and they appear to have offered a messenger, a mobile SMS service, and even custom profiles. Furthermore, the copyright information at the bottom of the page reveals a company of the same name, Excite Europe Limited. It's an interesting discovery, no doubt. However, it doesn't exactly tell us much about the Disney company or why they ended up buying this. What we do know, though, is that the original version of Paranoia wasn't actually purchased by them. It was something much less controversial. Unfortunately, archives of Paranoia's transition to this Excite branding only carry forward through April of the same year. 2002 is a complete dead zone. And then, right here, on February 7th of 2003, we get our first glimpse of Paranoia.com redirecting to Disney's hub site called Go. Again, I have absolutely no recollection of an IP tied to the name Paranoia. Yet, yeah, to be fair, I was just eight years old when they bought this. Kid me was probably just too busy. You know, being a kid, watching cartoons, and most importantly, In late 2002, Disney expanded its efforts into a myriad of entertainment mediums. Kingdom Hearts makes its debut. The Lion King premieres in IMAX. Epcot is celebrating its 20th anniversary, and a cartoon called Fillmore graces televisions for its short three-year tenure. Interestingly, Fillmore, while ending its run on Toon Disney, actually made its debut on ABC Kids an affiliate channel of the Disney company. In fact, Disney has purchased a monumental shit ton of companies over the years. And this revelation right here has made me think. What if, by the off chance, paranoia isn't directly tied to Disney at all? I mean, what if it's a random project of Boss Realty? a and ESPN, Catalyst Investments, Silver Creek Pictures, Buena Vista Games, Freeform, WLS7, KTRK13. What if this entire time we've been looking in the wrong place? You know, this mystery is interesting. Some of you may not even care. I mean, why, why, why is it a big deal anyway? Who really cares if Paranoia.com redirects to the official Disney homepage? I mean, it's something so silly, so innocent. And what if I don't find it? Then what? I just accept it? I move on, going about the rest of my life with this annoying, stupid little question resting in the back of my mind? I mean, statistically, upon viewing this chart, this task seems impossible. It could literally be any of these. So where in the world do we even...
stand by. Uh, Fairbanks, St. Louis, Buffalo, get ready. Remember, we're live, coast to coast. Live, coast to coast, America plays paranoia. You're playing from satellite cameras in living rooms around the country. You're connected by internet and by telephone. You're all battling one studio contestant. Paranoia, it starts now. Yes, this is Paranoia, and I'm Peter Tamarkin, and we're coming to you live. Coast to coast. To be honest, I'm not quite sure if this is it, but it feels like we're pretty damn close. Late into this video script, a fellow investigative YouTuber named Kylie tipped me off on this show, and while she said she wasn't able to confirm anything, she had a hunch that we're getting there. In April of 2000, the Fox Family Channel premiered a game show. It involved four contestants at a time one in the studio, and three scattered around the world. Paranoia consisted of 10 rounds of multiple choice questions, and the in-studio contestant was put up against the satellite players in a race for a grand prize of $10,000. Get a question right and move on to the next round. Get it wrong though, and lose $1,000 of potential winnings. It was a program that undoubtedly pushed the limits of what a live 2000s game show could be. And in retrospect, I don't think I've seen anything quite like it since. The unique thing about Paranoia, though, was that it incorporated audience interaction. The internet in 2000 was budding. And if you, sitting at home, wanted to jump into Paranoia for yourself, it was apparently just a website away. This is Fox Family Channel, and you're watching Paranoia Live. If you haven't already done so, get on that phone right now, pick it up, and call toll-free 187-PARANOIA and play our game and win some bucks and affect the outcome of the game. If you've got a computer, you know what to do. Log on to paranoia.excite.com. And holy shit. There it is. This is paranoia. This is why the Walt Disney Company owns this domain. It was a random show with a two-month tenure, owned by a subsidiary company of the corporation the URL was later redirected to and completely forgotten. Excite is a multinational company that facilitated a multitude of web and entertainment mediums and the portal to play paranoia for yourself, at least back then, is right here. America Plays Paranoia, a game that led to a mystery, and a mystery that endured completely under the radar for years. You know, this oddity has bugged me since Logical Elephant first made their post three entire years ago. It's something so simple on the surface, yet perplexing to me all around. It's an oddity that seems entirely ominous, yet is so much less so in reality. Paranoia.com is owned by Disney because of a scrapped game show that was forgotten to time. It's a relic of broadcast history, only remembered by the few who caught it. Maybe you'd just gotten off work. Maybe it was a late night rerun. No matter where you were, I'm at least confident on the conclusion we reached. It wasn't anything crazy, I know, but hey, at least it was closure. Paranoia. This paranoia was never related to Disney at all. As we've seen, the site is a monumental rabbit hole in itself, and perhaps we'll return to it at a later time. For now, though, I'm glad we found our answer and threw a bit of life into an almost completely forgotten artifact of broadcast history. Thank you all so much for joining me on this journey tonight. 
Videos like this one are some of my absolute favorites to make, and there's really nothing I enjoy diving into more than retro internet stuff. There's this charm to it that I can't quite pinpoint, and it's a nice breath of fresh air from the heavier content like Disturbing Things. Thank you all so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one. I love you all. And good night. You may think you've heard it all before. The notorious killers, the gruesome details, the heart-stopping twists. But this case takes it to a whole new level. This pint-sized predator is like nothing you've ever seen before. A child who seems innocent on the surface, but hides darkness within that is all too real. Welcome or welcome back to another episode of Twisted Minds. Today we're delving into a case that's sure to leave chills down your spine. We are unfolding the case of the world's youngest killer. And he's not just the world's youngest killer. He's also a serial killer. This means that he must have killed at least three people to earn that title. Intrigued? Let's get into it. The village of Musahar was home to a lot of people who were struggling to make ends meet. They worked long hours in the scorching heat of India, but still, their wages were barely enough to support their families. It was a tough life, but there was one thing that kept them going, the children. The village was teeming with little ones, and they brought a sense of joy and light to the community. They played together and their games were a welcome distraction for the hard-working villagers who had little else to look forward to. The families in this village were closely connected, and most of them were related. They banded together to support each other through tough times, but it was the children who truly made a difference. The Sada family was spread out across the village. They had lots of cousins, uncles, and aunts who were their neighbors. They didn't need to go far to see their family. In this close-knit community, the Sada family thrived. They knew that they were never alone, and their family and friends were always there to support them. And so, despite their hardships, they lived a joyful life in the village that they called home. The children of the Sada family loved nothing more than playing together in the streets. And amongst them was a sweet, six-year-old girl. One day, she headed out for her usual playtime with her cousins. But after the games were over, she didn't return home. Days passed, and still, there was no sign of her. The villagers took notice, but they didn't want to intrude on the family's privacy, assuming that they had the situation under control. This was the way of the village where people respected each other's boundaries and didn't pry into their personal affairs. Not long after the disappearance, the family was blessed with the arrival of another baby girl. Everyone was overjoyed, but soon after her birth, this little girl also disappeared. The family was devastated and the whole village was in shock. How could this happen again? The mother had carried this precious newborn for nine months but now she was gone. It was hard to believe that this could just be a coincidence, but someone took away her new ray of hope. There seemed to be no explanation regarding the strange things happening. The Sada family did not say anything to anyone regarding the case. The family remained tight-lipped about the whole affair, refusing to divulge any information to other villagers. As if she had just been erased from their family, her disappearance seemed not to matter to them. To onlookers, it was a baffling situation. How could anyone be so nonchalant about the disappearance of one of their own children? There were no visible signs of grief or mourning, no tears shed, and no stories shared about the two young girls. It was as if they had never existed in the first place. They began to wonder what was happening and why they behaved this way. Two young girls just disappeared from the face of the earth, and no one was saying anything about it. 
Fate had other plans, and tragedy struck the village once again in 2007. This infant was a six-month-old baby girl. However, this time, the victim was not a member of the Sada family, but a sweet, innocent baby girl named Kushpa. Kushpa's mother had dropped her off at the village primary school, thinking it was a safe place for her to be while she went to work. It was meant to be a safe haven, a place of security and love. But when her mother returned to pick her up, she was met with a nightmare. Kushpa was nowhere to be found, snatched away in the blink of an eye. As soon as the mother realized her daughter was missing, she had to find her baby, no matter what it took. Without a moment's hesitation, she sprang into action, running frantically around the village and asking anyone she met if they had seen her little girl. She was desperate for any clue, any hint of where her daughter might be. But no one seemed to have any information. The staff at the primary school, where her daughter was last seen, was just as confused and worried as she was. They had no idea how the child could have disappeared without anyone noticing. Desperate to find her missing daughter, Kushpa's mother scoured the entire village for any leads. No one seemed to know anything about the little girl's whereabouts. Just when all hope seemed lost, she stumbled upon a member of the Sada family. As she poured her heart out, explaining what happened to Kushpa, the family members seemed to have an inkling of what might have taken place. Without hesitation, they accompanied the mother to the police station to report the missing child. There, they shared all the details they had about Kushpa and provided the police with a possible suspect. It was a glimmer of hope in an otherwise hopeless situation. With a sense of urgency, the authorities took up the case and made their way to the small village to confront the prime suspect. The two of them took the police toward a group of children who gathered each day at the same spot to play. They singled out one particular boy and called him out of the crowd. The seemingly innocent child, bewildered and unsure, rushed over to meet the police. The officials asked the little boy if he knew anything about Kushpa's disappearance. The boy, without hesitation, said yes. The villagers held their breath as the little boy stood before the police, hoping that he would provide some helpful insight into Kushpa's disappearance. They were expecting to hear about her last known whereabouts or if anyone had seen her leave the village. But what the boy told the officers left everyone stunned. With the determined look in his eye, the boy spoke with unwavering conviction. He looked the officer dead in the eye and told her that Kushba was not missing, but she was dead. And the reason that he knew that was that he killed her himself. The villagers stood frozen in disbelief, struggling to come to terms with what they had just heard. The confession was beyond anyone's wildest imagination. Initially, the police dismissed the little boy's claims, believing that he was just playing some sort of cruel joke on them. They thought that he was just trying to waste their time by saying bizarre and outlandish things. However, their skepticism quickly turned to horror when the boy led them to the exact spot where he had tried to hide the body of the young child. Their fears were quickly confirmed. As they arrived at the location, the officers could feel their stomachs churn. The sight before them was too much to bear. There was a shallow grave where the little boy had buried the innocent baby. The little boy's story was no longer a twisted prank or figment of his imagination. The boy then began to tell them the chilling story of how he had taken Kushba from school and nobody had noticed him leaving with her. He carried her to a secluded area where he intended to satisfy his twisted desires. He started by strangling the baby, hoping to elicit a reaction of fear or desperation from her. But as the baby continued to cry, the boy grew frustrated that his efforts weren't enough to make him feel powerful. Determined to prove his dominance, he grabbed a stone from the ground and began striking the helpless baby with it until her body gave out. The officers couldn't believe the horror that they were hearing. 
The boy told the police while laughing, I killed her by repeatedly hitting her with a brick. This innocent seeming boy was describing the senseless murder of a helpless baby who had done nothing wrong to anyone. What was more disturbing than that was the fact that the person telling the story was a little boy himself. The story checked out. He was not making up a story out of his imagination. He was not boasting in front of his friends. This actually happened. The police realized the seriousness of the situation and immediately took the young boy to the police station. This was the youngest criminal that the police had ever seen. And he was sitting right in front of them. Except he did not look or act like a criminal. The little boy kept quiet most of the time he remained seated, swinging his feet in the chair and smiling at the officers whenever they looked at him. To Inspector Shatrugan Kumar, it was baffling how this young boy could be capable of such a monstrous act. The boy even demanded biscuits, as if he had no idea the gravity of his actions. It was almost as if he couldn't comprehend the concept of death or the irreversible consequences of his actions. The officer kept looking for a reason, asking the boy, why did you do it? But the boy had no answer. He simply just kept smiling. This little boy was eight-year-old Amarjeet Sada. He was born in 1998 in Bagusarai, Bihar, to a poor family. His father was a laborer with very low pay. When Amarjeet was seven years old, his baby sister was born, bringing the family to a total of four children. With so many mouths to feed and repeated pregnancies, it became difficult for the family to manage their income. And so, in hopes of finding a job that could be sufficient for the family, they moved to the village of Musahar, where the incidents occurred. As a child, Amarjeet was quiet and reserved. He seemed like a normal kid. So, how come a member of his own family suspected Amarjeet had something to do with the missing children? The disappearance of two girls from the Sada family was not a mere coincidence. By now, it was clear they were ruthlessly murdered by none other than Amarji. In 2006, his six-year-old cousin had gone missing. And at the time, Amarji was seven years old. And as Amarji committed his crimes, it was uncovered that he killed his own cousin in the same brutal way he killed baby Kushba. Amarji had taken his cousin to a secluded area where he strangled her while enjoying the fear that took over her body. This little girl fought for her life, kicking and screaming. But just as she was about to lose her life, Amarji let go of her neck. She grasped for air and tried to catch her breath, but Amarji wasn't done yet. He grabbed a nearby rock and smashed her head with it until she passed away. It seems like there's a disturbing pattern emerging here. This young boy had a cruel streak and took pleasure in causing suffering to those he killed. Soon after the murder, his family found out about him as Amarjeet did not keep his sins a secret. When asked about it, he immediately confessed. The truth came out in front of his whole family, including the father of the girl, his uncle. And what did the family decide to do about it? Keep quiet. Yes, sadly, the family considered it a family matter. And so they thought they should keep this information to themselves and not get any third party involved. They chose to protect the boy. They may have thought that Amarji was too young to fully grasp the idea of death. So he didn't really understand what happened. His family talked to him and tried to help him understand. And then they all tried to move on from the sad event. They hoped that Amarji had learned from what happened and wouldn't do anything like that again a decision that they quickly regretted because it led him to becoming the youngest serial killer in the world. Unfortunately, a few months later, something very disturbing happened. Despite his family's efforts, Amarji once again showed signs of his dangerous behavior. This time, he turned his attention to his own home, his own blood, his own family, his little sister. 
Amarjeet's mother had put his newborn baby sister down for a nap. Seeing her sleep so peacefully, Amarjeet went over to her. He took her out of the house to an isolated area and repeated the same thing with her. The same cruel, heinous act. Within six months, the boy had caused the death of two innocent people. When the family realized the two were missing, they went to talk to Amarjeet and he immediately admitted to killing her without trying to hide it. But the family stood by his side and kept the whole incident a secret. At the time when Kushba died, the circumstances were different. This was not a member of the family, so he could not count on them to keep the family's lips shut. The mother was not going to back down. She wanted answers. She wanted justice for her baby. Word got out. Police got involved and the boy was taken into custody. There are lots of speculations regarding the family's decision to sweep everything under the carpet. Some say the reason why the Sada family did not report the boy who killed their daughters was to shield him. As in certain families, boys are seen as valuable assets, while girls are deemed to be burdens. Had the boy murdered male members of the family, they may have reported it. It is a regrettable reality. And of course, there is a possibility of him being subjected to severe abuse by his family throughout his life until that moment, which might have been the source of his sadistic tendencies. After all, where does such a young boy learn of such heinous acts? According to the laws in India, Amarjeet was too young to be held accountable for his crimes when he committed murder. As a result, he was sent to a juvenile home, where he was isolated from others. Medical experts who treated Amarjeet discovered that he enjoyed hurting others and suffered from a behavioral disorder called conduct disorder. The condition can cause kids to become antisocial and can lead to violent acts such as murder, assault, or sexual crimes. The hope is that the years of treatment and therapy that Amarjeet received while in the juvenile home helped him out. When he turned 18, he was allowed to leave. After his time in the juvenile home, Amarjeet was released with a new identity, and nobody knows where he is now. It's possible that he's still living in India, but he's likely using a different name and living a different life. Seeing that he was born in 1998, Amarjeet would be turning 25 in 2023. Would you consider the rehabilitated 25-year-old Amarjeet as the same person who committed those heinous acts all those years ago? We can only hope that he has grown and changed since then. Amarjeet Sada's case is considered to be one of the most shocking and disturbing cases of juvenile crime in India. The case is a heartbreaking reminder of the importance of early intervention and mental health support for children who exhibit concerning behavior. Although his crimes were heinous and his actions unforgivable, we can't help but wonder what could have led a child to commit such atrocities. Whatever the case may be, one thing is for sure. Amarjeet Sada will go down in history as one of the most infamous serial killers of all time. Let's just hope that we never have to encounter anyone like him again. Thanks for tuning in to Twisted Minds. That was the case of Amarjeet Sada. And why don't you go ahead and click on one of the two videos
This case takes place in Sydney, Australia, in the year 1988. In 1986, the country of Australia was outraged by the brutal death of Anita Cobby. Anita was walking home from a night out when she was kidnapped near a quiet train station by a number of men who pulled her into the car and then dragged her into a field. These men then committed what is considered to be one of the very worst crimes in Australian history. The murder of Anita was horrendous and especially cruel. There are even rumours that much of what happened to her was suppressed by the media and police as to not anger and disturb the country more than they already were. Some of you may be familiar with this case, as I did cover it just a few months ago. Australia hoped that no such case would ever happen again, but just two years later, a similar case would take place. Yet again sparking outrage, and galvanizing the public to seek justice for the victim. Janine Balding was a 20-year-old woman who lived in Sydney, New South Wales. Janine was born on the 7th of October 1967. She was raised in Wagga Wagga, New South Wales, which at the time had a population of around 40,000. Janine had a happy upbringing. She was close with her mother and father, and she had three other siblings. Her parents would later recall Janine in her younger years. They said they couldn't remember a time when she wasn't smiling. They said their daughter was incredibly happy and bubbly, and had a number of loyal and close friends in her youth. Janine enjoyed her time in Wagga Wagga, but as she got older, she wanted something more exciting. She wanted to move to a bigger city. Janine's older sister had been living in Sydney for a few years, and Janine desperately wanted to move and join her big sister in a city that had more going on. So when she finished her studies, she made the decision to move with the full support of her friends and family. Janine's sister was living in the family's holiday home right by the ocean in Cronulla, so Janine already had a place lined up to live. She arrived in Sydney and began looking for a job, and fairly quickly she was able to find employment with a bank on George Street, one of Sydney's busiest streets. Not long after moving to Sydney, Janine met a man by the name of Stephen Moran. The two hit it off right away, and they began a relationship. Things were going so well, in fact, that the two became engaged. Her family would later recall that she was incredibly excited about this new chapter of her life. The two bought their own house together in Berkeley Vale. The couple spent a good chunk of their savings on purchasing the property, so they planned to rent out the home until their wedding day as a means to finance their wedding. And once they were married, the two would move in together and begin their own family. But until that day came, Janine stayed living in Sydney with her sister. On the morning of the 8th of September 1988, Janine made her way to work. She had stayed in her fiancé's house the night before, so she drove to Sutherland Station and left her car in the car park and took the train into Sydney to work. This decision would soon result in her untimely death. As on this day, a gang of thugs created horrific plans to abduct someone in that very station. This gang included Matthew Elliott, a 16-year-old who was described as an uncontrollable youth who ran away from his home in the western suburbs of Sydney. He had spent the vast majority of his teenage years in and out of institutions, and not for minor crimes. He had an extensive criminal record for someone of his age. This included arson, breaking and entering, assault and theft. Another was 22-year-old Shorty Jameson. Shorty had the mental capacity of a 10-year-old, and he too had an extensive criminal record including SA, malicious wounding and robbery. Then there was Bronson Blessington, 14. He left his home when he was around 9 and spent most of his time on the streets of Sydney. He was often in trouble with the police for petty thefts. And finally, there was Wayne Wilmot, who was 15. He had a criminal record when he was still in the single digits. His criminal record included dozens of essays, assaults, stealing, and theft. He had been placed into various foster homes, but he just preferred to live on the streets. Wayne also had a girlfriend, 
15-year-old Carol Arrow. She had run away from her country home too, and she had stopped in Sydney. Carol had learning difficulties, and she would often associate with people who would take advantage of her. On the morning of the 8th of September 1988, the gang all met up and began talking about the crimes each of them had committed, bragging about which one had committed the worst act. Then Bronson uttered some of the most vile words I have ever covered on the channel. He said, let's go get a Sheila and a paper. Of course, the usual reaction to such a suggestion would be disgust, but not for this gang. They actually believed this to be a good idea. None of them thought much about the moral implications of such a vile act, and they agreed to set out and do their best to bring the idea into fruition. As I mentioned earlier, the murder of Anita Cobby was still in the minds of many in Sydney, and it was in the minds of this gang. They knew that the best opportunity they would have would be to target a lone woman near a train station in the dead of night, just like what happened to Anita Cobby. So the gang made their way from Central Station to Sutherland Railway Station, the place where Janine had parked her car earlier that day. But this particular spot would be a criminal's dream. It had parking spots in secluded areas that would be out of view from the public. During the train journey to Sutherland Station, the gang attempted to intimidate other passengers. They threatened a number of students on the train, telling them that if they did not give up their seats, they would smash their heads in. Shorty Jameson even found a lone woman on the train and tried his best to make her feel as uncomfortable as possible. He kept showing her an adult magazine and repeated vulgar phrases to her. The gang finally reached their destination at around 5pm. They waited at the station to find a victim, and it wouldn't be long until they did. 19-year-old Christine had just arrived at the car park right alongside the station. She walked towards her vehicle and searched her bag for her car keys. She opened the door, but just before she would get inside, she heard a noise. She turned around to see one of the gang members standing there, looking rather suspicious. She got into her car as the gang members approached. One of them asked Christine what the time was, and she replied, 20 past 5. Christine knew that something was off. She became worried as flashbacks of Anita's murder came to mind. She locked her car doors and began driving out of the parking lot, but as she did, one of the gang stepped in front of her car to make Christine stop. He walked down the side of the car and asked Christine for some money, but as he asked this, Christine spotted a knife in his hand that he was trying to hide. Christine wasted no time. She sped away and got home as quickly as she could. She was terrified and wondered what exactly she had just escaped from. She arrived home in a frantic state and told her fiancé everything that had just occurred. Her fiancé was deeply worried and suggested they go to the police right away and inform them of what had happened. So they drove to the police station and gave a statement to some officers. The officers said that they would look into the matter, but they didn't dispatch any officers to the location. The couple left somewhat disappointed in the lack of urgency shown by the police, so they decided to drive by the station on their way home to see if the gang was still there. Around this time, Janine had just arrived at the car park and was heading to her car. Christine and her fiancé pulled up at the station to see Janine in her recognisable bank uniform being accosted by the gang. Christine's fiancé had a badly broken leg. He was in no condition to fight with four males, especially knowing that at least one of them had a knife. They decided that the best thing to do would be to drive as quickly as possible back to the police station and inform them that the gang was still operating in the area and had a potential victim. Christine and her fiancé turned the car around and headed straight back to the station. The police immediately dispatched a number of officers to the scene, and Christine and her fiancé followed closely behind. But by the time they got there, the gang and Janine were gone. As Janine had tried to walk to her car, the gang attacked her. They forced her into the backseat of her own car and quickly drove away from the scene. In the backseat of the car, Matthew Elliott forced himself upon Janine as Bronson held a knife to her throat and threatened her not to fight back. Shorty also did his part 
in holding Janine down. The gang would later say that Janine begged and pleaded with them to be let free, but they ignored her pleas for mercy. In the driver's seat was Wayne Wilmot, and in the front passenger seat was Carol. Upon hearing the chilling screams and pleas, Wayne told Carol to perform an act upon him. Amidst the attack, Carol pulled out Wayne's privates and did as she was told. The three others in the back took turns committing vile acts upon Janine. Using the knife, Elliot sliced off Janine's clothing and threatened that he would cut her if she tried to do anything. They stuffed Janine's clothing into her mouth so she wouldn't be able to make as much noise. They drove Janine's car for nearly an hour into the western suburbs, with each minute being described in court as hell on earth for Janine, as she was beaten and repeatedly essayed at knife point. One of the gang then said, It's a nice night for a murder. They all began laughing and joking that they should kill her. One of the boys then suggested a location that he knew of that would be quiet and that this would be the perfect spot to kill Janine without anyone seeing. He suggested a small dam near the main road that they were driving on. The gang pulled up at the area where the dam was located. Bronson, Shorty and Matthew dragged Janine towards the water. She tried her best to resist and fight them, but she was powerless against three males. Janine was pushed over a fence where she broke her wrist quite badly, making it even harder to fight back. Meanwhile, Wayne and Carol stayed in the car and continued to do what they were doing before. They had little interest in the fate of Janine and just how much she was suffering. The three others dragged Janine out of the sight of any potential passers-by or cars and they continued to essay her again. Janine screamed out, so one of them grabbed her scarf and used it to silence her as the rest of her clothing was removed. After the three felt as if they were done with Janine, they realized that if they were to let her go, she would be able to tell the police everything and they would be caught. They all agreed that they needed to kill Janine. One of them went back to the car whilst the other two guarded Janine so she couldn't escape. They looked inside Janine's car for anything they could use to kill her. They found some rope and then returned to Janine and the two others. The three hogtied her. Janine's feet were tied together and then the rope was wrapped around her neck and tightened so that her knees were under her chin. The rope was then wrapped under her knees again and pulled even tighter. The position would have been extremely painful and made it very hard to breathe. Janine was then dragged into the waters of the dam and drowned. The gang would later recall that it took some time for her to finally pass away. But once they knew she was dead, they decided to take all of her jewellery, including her engagement ring. They also looked in Janine's purse and found her bank card, along with a piece of paper with all of her PIN numbers written on it. The three rejoined Carol and Wayne in Janine's car, and they drove away from the horrendous crime scene. But as they were making their getaway, Janine's car broke down. The gang abandoned it on the side of the road and walked the rest of the way. The gang then used Janine's cards to withdraw hundreds of dollars, and they shared it amongst themselves. Now on this night, Janine was supposed to be staying at her fiancé's home, as that's why she had parked in the station that she had been abducted in. When she didn't return home as planned, Steve thought little about this. He simply believed that she had finished late, or that she had made other plans and had stayed with her sister for the night. The following day, the police received a phone call. Someone had spotted what appeared to be an abandoned car. Officers were dispatched to the location, and what they found raised some suspicion. There was evidence that something was horribly wrong. Underwear were found in the back seat, and not far from the car was a handbag, which appeared to have been ransacked. The car's registration was linked to Janine's name, so they decided to call Janine's place of residence to see if she was okay. Janine's sister had been staying at her boyfriend's home that night, so she had no idea if her sister had made it home the night before. She quickly checked the flat they shared, but Janine was nowhere to be seen. They contacted her fiancé Stephen, who told the police that he had not seen her either, but that she was supposed to come back to his place the night before, but he assumed she had just made other plans. Officers then discovered that Janine didn't make it into work. Janine's parents were contacted back in Wagga Wagga, and they were asked if they had seen Janine, but they too had not. 
It was clear that something horrible had happened and Jim Lee was reported missing. An investigator was assigned to the disappearance, the very same lead investigator who had worked on the case of Anita Cobby. Although it wouldn't take long to find the twisted individuals who were responsible for her death. The very same evening that Janine was reported missing, Matthew and Bronson were arrested by police. A social worker at the homeless accommodation they were staying in overheard the boys talking about a car they had stolen. The police were immediately called and the two boys were arrested. They were questioned by investigators, but initially, the boys were only going to be questioned about the carjacking. But as soon as the officers sat them down, one of the boys pulled out of his pocket a switchblade knife and told officers that they had information on a missing woman. The two boys concocted a tale that some of their friends had murdered a young woman and they said they could show the officers where the body was. The investigators took the boys upon their offer. They hopped into a vehicle and made their way to the dam where Janine had been murdered and there they found the horrific crime scene. Janine's family were called and they were told the devastating news. But Janine's mother and father wanted to make sure it was really her. They went to the morgue and confirmed their worst fears. The body was indeed their beloved daughter. It goes without saying that the family were distraught with grief. They just couldn't figure out why anyone would want to harm Janine. She had no enemies and she was friendly to everyone she met. Now, this is something that I found to be incredibly touching. Janine's family were about to enter a nightmare, a nightmare that another family were all too familiar with. Anita Cobby's parents, Gary and Grace, couldn't bear the thought of someone else having to go through what they went through with no guidance. They decided to reach out to Janine's family and offered them some much needed support. They told them what to expect in the coming days, how to navigate the relentless media and how the court proceedings would work. Gary and Grace were with the family every step of the way, something that gave them some much needed comfort in such horrific times. Janine's family were incredibly grateful to just have some people who truly understood what they were going through. Meanwhile, Matthew and Bronson were being questioned further, and they provided true details of the killers and kidnappers. A warrant was issued for Carol Arrow and Wayne Wilmont. The couple were quickly found in King's Cross, and they were arrested. A nationwide manhunt was conducted looking for Shorty. Shorty Jemison is a rather odd looking individual and stands out amongst a crowd. His mother had consumed alcohol and illegal substances before he was born and this severely impacted him. He was quickly found and arrested in Queensland. All five were questioned about the murder. They all gave a similar story but they all denied being the one who actually killed Janine. They all claimed that an individual by the name of Scott Agus was the one who truly was responsible for the murder. Scott was arrested and questioned by the police. He denied any involvement and seemed to be genuinely confused. He was able to provide a solid alibi. He had been with a number of social workers when the crime occurred and this was confirmed. Scott was released by the officers when they became convinced that he played no role whatsoever. The evidence for the other five being involved was overwhelming. At this time, DNA evidence was still in its infancy. The United Kingdom was one of the leaders in this technology, so samples were taken of the five and were sent off to the UK to be tested. The DNA evidence found inside Janine implicated Bronson and Matthew, but not Shorty. A number of witnesses came forward and remembered seeing the gang covered in dirt and mud. They were using a bank card to withdraw money at the time. Christine, the first woman to be harassed by the gang, was brought in as a witness. She was immediately able to pick out a number of the gang members in a police lineup. Wayne and Carol's fingerprints were found in Janine's car, linking them to the crime. The knife used in the attack was also traced to a shop. The owner of this shop was shown images of the gang and he was able to identify Matthew as the one who purchased the blade. And when Carol was arrested, she was found to be wearing Janine's watch. Despite having no DNA evidence against Shorty, plenty of witnesses came forward and they distinctly remembered seeing him with the gang before and after the murder. He was picked out numerous times. 
When Christine had heard the news about Janine, she was distraught. She beat herself up, believing that she should have done more to save her. But Janine's parents assured her that she had nothing to be sorry for, and that she did everything she could by alerting the police. The trial would soon begin. Janine's mother Beverly bravely said that she would attend every single day of the trial. She wanted to know exactly what these monsters had done to her daughter. The court was presented with the horrific details of the crime, how Janine begged to be saved, how she tried to fight back, and how she was essayed multiple times at night point. Beverly heard it all, in what I can imagine must have been unbelievably traumatic. As the details of the case were read out, the gang began to laugh and they made a number of jokes. They would often shout out and jeer as the jury and the rest of the court looked at them in pure disgust. But the trial would soon have to be put to an end temporarily, causing much stress to the family. The gang decided to change their story and claimed that Shorty Jemison wasn't actually present at the murder and that it was actually another person who was also called Shorty. They identified another homeless man named Mark Shorty Wells as their accomplice. Mark Shorty Wells was a schizophrenic and a self-described Satanist. He was tracked down in Brisbane more than a year after the murder. In court, it became clear that he knew some of the details of the murder, but he said that the reason he knew these details was because he had a dream during a seance. Eventually, Mark Shorty Wells was acquitted of any wrongdoing, and the second trial was now to be held. However, before this happened, the charges against Carol Arrow were dropped, as she was found to have serious mental deficiencies. Wayne Wilmont entered a plea as the police accepted that he stayed in the car with Carol during the time of the murder. He was sentenced to 10 years. Evidence cementing Shorty Jemison's involvement in the crime was brought before the court. He had bragged to another prisoner about the crime, stating that he would do it again if he was ever given the chance. This prisoner testified against him in court. Stephen Shorty Jemison, Matthew Elliott and Bronson Blessington were all found guilty of the murder of Janine Balding. The public were furious. They wanted the death sentence for all three, or at least life without parole, and the public got what they wanted. All three were sentenced to life without the possibility of ever being released. The killers, even to this day, do their best to appeal the sentence. Beverly attended every single appeal and did her best to ensure that these monsters who killed her daughter would never, under any circumstances, ever be released. When Wilmont, who was given 10 years, was let out after serving 7 years, he would go on to essay another further four women and was sentenced to for these crimes. He was ordered to attend a course to show the damage essay has done to people, but during this course, he exposed himself to a nurse and tried to attack his therapist after he told the therapist that Janine got what she deserved. Wayne is one of the few people in Australian history not to have been convicted of murder but still deemed far too dangerous to ever be released. In 2019, psychological assessments were conducted on Wayne. He was found to have an IQ of just 74. He was found to be highly callous, manipulative and deceptive traits consistent with a psychopath. The others also still remain in prison, where hopefully they will stay until their final days. However, Bronson insists he is a changed man and that he has found God. He has been speaking and writing to an Anglican minister named Simon Manchester every week for the past 12 years. Reverend Manchester believes that he is now rehabilitated and is deeply remorseful for his part in the murder of Janine. The Reverend said in an interview, I think that what he did was horrendous, and if I was the Balding family, I don't know how I would cope. But I have observed him for over 12 years, and he is a genuine believer. Despite the claims that Bronson has turned his life around, the Balding family have never received an apology from him. Janine's brother doesn't believe for one second that Bronson is genuinely changed, and went on to say about his religious conversion, if he thinks he's going to the same heaven as my sister, he's mistaken. The case of Janine Balding shook Australia to its core, much like the case of Anita Cobby. It can't be understated just how much of a hero Janine's mother Beverly is. Despite it being incredibly painful, 
She fought to the end of her days to make sure justice was kept for her daughter, attending every hearing and appeal, and helping to push for legislation to prevent such criminals from ever being released. Beverly passed away in 2015. She is buried alongside her beloved daughter, Janine. It would be difficult to find a person who had a deep and serious thought about the scale of outer space and our universe and didn't feel the utter chilling to the bone terror. Endless empty space, terrifying black holes, able to practically erase matter, and trillions of strange worlds, exoplanets that are so distant and mysterious that they seem unattainable. Today we'll tell you about six incredible exoplanets with conditions that resemble real hell, just floating through space entirely isolated and some even fooling astronomers. First is Corot 7b. First on the list is an exoplanet with a very exotic precipitation. And no, no umbrella will help you unless it's made from titanium. Meet Koro 7b, a planet where it constantly rains rocks. The size of this unusual planet is just over 1.5 times the size of Earth. Its age is about 1.5 billion years. It's relatively close by, only 489 light years from us. Back in 2019, when Koro B was first discovered, the scientists considered it the first rocky exoplanet that resembles Earth. However, we class it as uninhabitable with 0% probability of life on the planet. If you're ever lucky enough to watch the sunrise on this planet, the sunrise would be the last thing that ever happens to you. The rays of the morning star Koro 7 from the Monoceros or Unicorn constellation will turn you into ash as soon as the sun appears over the horizon. The reason sunrise on this planet is so much brighter is due to the fact Koro 7b is 60 times closer to its star than we are to our sun. In essence, the visible size of the Koro 7 star is 360 times larger than the way we see the sun. Temperature on the sunny side of the planet can reach 4,700 degrees Fahrenheit or 2,600 degrees centigrade, which makes the surface hot enough to melt and vaporize rocks. Next, something incredible happens. Hot vaporized rock rises to the upper atmosphere where condensation happens, turning the vapors into fine gravel during the colder front passing which leads to the small rock fragments falling to the ground, better known as the literal rock rain. Looking deeper into it, some theoretical models suggest you can come across the entire ocean of lava on this planet. The situation is made even more dire due to the fact the planet is locked in in this position with the fire and sulfur side always facing the host star. At the same time, the other side of the planet is very cold, with surface temperatures reaching as low as negative 390 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 235 degrees centigrade. Astronomers think that Koro 7b formed initially as a gas giant, 
which was 100 times larger than Earth. But as it moved closer to its star, the gas membrane was getting thinner under the influence of the sun moon, until all that was left was the rocky core. Such is the unenviable past of Coro 7b, the no less terrifying present. We hope the rough conditions of that world didn't put you off because we're moving on to the next planet. Although the next horrifying world doesn't have the same inferno-like conditions, it certainly fits into the category of places you never want to go near. Because trying to get to J1407B, you would come across an endless belt of rock and ice. It's tempting to compare this massive gas giant to our Saturn because it's surrounded by gigantic rings, except they're 200 times wider than the ones around Saturn. Saturn only has three main rings. J1407b has 30 rings spanning across over 110 million miles. Now let that sink in. That's 20% more than the distance from Earth to the Sun, which is 93 million miles, which is 1.2 astronomical units. For comparison, the radius of Saturn's largest ring is only about 300,000 miles. Rings of this scale only form thanks to mass destruction of a planet's satellites. So what might have happened? It's likely that the mass of J1407b is between 10 and 40 times the mass of Jupiter. That's a huge celestial body, the gravity of which just ripped the satellites apart. There's another theory that J1407b is not a gas giant, but an actual protostar that was never able to become a brown dwarf. Currently, there's no consensus in the scientific community as to how to properly classify such objects. Another argument towards the theory that J1407b is an incomplete star is the fact that the object moves along its orbit around the host star as opposed to around the mutual center of gravity like happens with a dual star system. What's amazing is that these huge rings have a mass of only 7.34 by 10 to the 21 tons. Why only? This impressive number is comparable to Earth's mass, 5.9 by 10 to the 21. In the history of J1407b could have been many amazing and frightening events. One of them could have been a collision with a satellite with the mass somewhere between Earth and Mars. The trace of this encounter, a large gap in the rings of J1407b. Speaking of which, thanks to these gaps, the scientists managed to discover this planet. Using the transit observation method, the scientists managed to find out not only the size, but also the position of the rings around the planet. Take a look at the visualization of the Saturn rings, a truly magnificent sight. We can only imagine what kind of view we can have if we were on J1407b or one of its satellites, but this view would definitely cost us a jaw because ours would be dropped. Now we're heading closer to home. About 80 light years from the sun is an object that can be rightfully crowned as one of the loneliest in the universe. The interesting thing about the planet with a complex name, PSO J318.5-22, is that it doesn't revolve around a star. PSO J318 belongs to the special classification of planets called rogue planets, sometimes called orphans or nomads. These planets are ejected from their planetary system and now they just wander through the endless emptiness of space. Paradoxically, the absence of a bright star only played into the hands of astronomers. They can directly observe the light of PSO J318 without it being overshadowed by the host star. Since the surveillance is performed using the PS1 Panoramic Survey Telescope PANSTARS, the excess light really hinders observation. It allowed to take hundreds of infrared photographs, which reveal that the planet's eight times larger than our Jupiter and much brighter too. The shifts in its brightness showed that the planet does a complete turn every five hours and has several layers of thick and thin clouds with a temperature around 1470 degrees Fahrenheit. Surveillance performed by a group of astronomers using new technology telescope at the European Southern Observatory in Chile allowed them to create one of the first somewhat accurate weather forecasts for a celestial body beyond the solar system. 
And now, a quick weather report. We're expecting a cloudy but very warm day with dust storms several times the speed of sound and possible precipitation in the form of molten iron rain. The estimated age of the planet, it's around 12 million years old. Scientists don't know exactly how such planets are formed, but they theorize that such objects were either unsuccessful stars, gas giants several times as large as Jupiter, or planets ejected from young planetary systems after encountering another planet under the influence of its gravitational field. After being cut off from the gravitational influence, they don't return to their original system, doomed to drift through space until they're pulled into the gravitational field of another star system. As a result, there's an issue with classification of PSOJ318 and similar planets because many scientists tend to refer to such objects as sub-ground dwarfs, meaning at their temporary state. Not yet a star, but not quite a planet. Gas giant either, at least as we know it. Although the scientists have records of quite a few rogue planets, this is only the beginning of their research. We're likely to be amazed by the news of the properties of these incredible interstellar objects in the future. We're moving on to witness the slow merry-go-round of death, a place where we'll find WASP, 12B, planet labeled by scientists as Doom. Being on its surface is impossible for a number of reasons, but the most significant one being that the planet's literally torn apart by its host star, piece by piece, sending it out into the outer space. According to its characteristics, WASP-12b is a gas giant with a radius about twice the size of Jupiter's. However, unlike Jupiter that performs one full revolution around the sun in 12 Earth years, WASP-12b fully revolves around its host star in one day. Such speeds create unbelievable tidal forces on the surface of the planet, causing it to distort. If the scientists' calculations are accurate, WASP-12b is shaped more like an egg than a sphere. Astronomers estimate that the planet won't be able to withstand such torture much longer, a maximum of 10 million years, after which the planet will completely fall apart, forming a gas and dust cloud that will be gradually consumed by the star. Furthermore, the planet speeds up as it exchanges matter with its star. Until this moment, the scientists thought this type of exchange was only possible between stars. The case of WASP-12b is the first confirmed case of this phenomenon happening to an exoplanet. This gravitational dance really heats up the planet, making it reach temperatures up to 4,100 degrees Fahrenheit, making any possibility of life on its surface obsolete. But five years after the planet was discovered, the Hubble telescope managed to use the spectroscopy method to detect the signs of a water stream an incredible discovery considering the conditions on this planet. The other shocking discovery is that the hard surface of this planet, if it indeed exists, can be made of graphite and diamonds. The reason for that is the high concentration and density of carbon in the composition of the planet. Some media outlets even nicknamed WASP-12b the Diamond Planet, but for now, Scientists are more inclined to think the vast majority of the carbon is contained in the planet's atmosphere in the form of carbon monoxide and methane. Additionally, in 2012, research established that the planet may have a satellite, WASP-12b1. Its radius estimated to be 6.4 times the size of Earth's radius, which is only three times smaller than the radius of the planet itself. What kind of conditions are on the surface of the satellite, we can only guess. Probably not much better than its torn apart neighbor. And the next planet is surrounded by real mystery. We're talking about Formal Hot B, formerly known as Dagon, a distant world that didn't exist. Are you intrigued yet? Well, let's dig in. Let's go back to 2004. The Hubble telescope discovered a gigantic cold debris disk of gas and dust. Immediately, the theories about the object started circulating, including the estimation of the planet's size, which could be three times as large as Jupiter. 
Furthermore, the scientists still hadn't managed to get a look at the huge planet, which was supposed to rotate around Fomalhaut, one of the brightest stars in the night sky. Located relatively nearby at 25 light years away with a radius twice as large as the sun. Research showed that Dagon was behaving in a very strange manner. The speed of the object kept increasing as time went by. Four years later in 2008, the news that an image of Dagon was captured causing a real sensation in the scientific community. It was proven that the planet is much smaller than estimated previously with a mass somewhere between Earth and Mars. The dim glow of Dagon in the infrared range and its inability to affect the debris ring of the Fomalhaut star indicated a low mass. Additionally, the brightness of the object decreased while its size got bigger and its orbital movement did not correspond to the predicted data. Scientists have reached an impasse. Astronomy has not yet encountered anything like this. In 2014, Dagon decided to finish the scientists off and just disappeared. Although in previous years, the object was consistently registered. Starting in 2008, the planet started increasing in size and becoming more dim until it was completely gone. All of these events went against everything the scientists knew about exoplanets. The researchers had to practically review the data again to come to a new radical conclusion that the planet Dagon never existed. The new theory proposed by the scientists suggests that the object originally interpreted as an exoplanet was a slowly dissipating dust cloud that formed as a result of a massive collision between two asteroids or planet fetuses. This discovery is even more amazing because a collision between two small celestial bodies is incredibly rare. The collision must have happened back in 2004 when the Hubble telescope was surveying the area around Fomalhaut. Coincidence number one. As time went by, the dust began to spread, which explains the increase of the object's size and the lowering brightness. Coincidence number two. And the dust cloud that formed in the collision explained the eccentric orbit. Coincidence number three. And so a string of incredible coincidences confused the astronomers created a beautiful legend about a strange and unpredictable planet Dagon that does not look like a planet or move like a planet, does not revolve around a host star on an elliptic orbit like a planet, and instead moves along a runaway trajectory that eventually takes it far away from the star. Although Fomalhaut B lost its exoplanet status, it's no reason to be discouraged. There are thousands of known and confirmed exoworlds waiting for us, which are definitely going to surprise us with their terrifying yet incredible characteristics. And how about a journey to a planet that witnessed the first steps of our universe? The incredible world of Captain B is only 13 light years away from us, but its age is estimated at 11.5 billion years, which is about two and a half times older than our Earth and only two billion years younger than the universe. But we're not just impressed by the age of this rock hurling through space, but also all the things that may have happened on the surface of the planet throughout its existence. The thing is, this planet's host star, Captain, is classed as a red subdwarf, and therefore it has an anomalous luminosity spectrum due to its age. The star radiates almost 250 times less light than our star and has a mass a quarter of the sun's mass. As such, the scientists claim that the planet is within the habitable zone in relation to its star, even though it's very close, only 0.168 astronomical units, which is even closer than the distance between the sun and Mercury. Theoretically, the temperature on its surface allows the water to retain its liquid form. By some estimation, the temperature varies between negative 58 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 50 centigrade on the dark side and 50 degrees Fahrenheit.
調整しなきゃ我に力を
材と知識を知真理を探り、ロビューを混雑する。楽しみにしているぞ。世の万物人事。な。我々は塔に嵐に住み、守るべきもののために。打ち崩せ。地上が。ああ。上手な。強いのだ。正当な秘訣。存在と知識をし。真理を探り。ロビューを混雑する。天木図派気迫を示せ<笑>ようこそ凡人のステージへ速やかに作戦を調整しなきゃ。
速やかに作戦我に力を回答を楽しくすハッ<笑>
客の庭に入りたい王国の庭に入り願いましょう鳴り響き一死同時にな痛い目は戻るゆっくり行きましょうはっ立ちなさい命の果てにいずれ風に吹き落とされる最悪の力
調整しなきゃ。
私を楽しませてくれるガツンと来るやつですかふん<笑> 2倍速ってこんなもの我々はとうに嵐の国守るべき者のために打ち崩せ私が壊すに我に力を願いましょう鳴り響く一死同時にな一旦本部の手を見ゆっくり行きましょうはっ落ち着いて命のいずれ風に吹き落とされる運命の選択ではない皆そこで深淵を迎える。皆そこで深淵を迎えよう<笑>命のいずれ風に吹き落とされる揺らぐことおかゆしゃんまだ生きてるのリア<笑>呼吸するさ<笑><笑>
客の庭に入りたい。なりひび一死同時にな情熱変身いたん本気でもいいぞ亡霊がまた行ったゴー絶好を剣に出す研究の価値あり落ち着いて命のいずれ風に吹き落とされる呼吸するそのふっはっ弱っよいしょ勝ちなさい爽快命のいずれ風に吹き落とされる。
今の僕でもヌースに認められていないのだからこれからも認められることはないだろう。ようこそ、エンジン。一旦。リスクが高いかも。生産しましょう。市場が変わって、長期間見据えるのが、成功の秘訣。呼吸するその感覚。<笑>
人は文をわきまえることを学ぶべきいったんいいところに来たわね
願いましょう鳴り響く痛い本物とは思えずいいところに来たわね<笑>落ち着いて研究の価値ある<笑>いずれ風に吹き落とされる。